probably, so everyone at home is gonna get that little consent thing to say, yes, we've got it. I don't wanna leave the meeting. Okay. All right, we can go to the next slide then. Awesome. So this uh, slide is just showing where the Tryon Creek watershed is in context of the Portland metro area. Uh, you can see that it's a kind of multicolored blob in about the middle of the screen. Um, the Tryon Creek Watershed Council works to keep the Tryon Creek watershed healthy. That's what watershed councils do across the state. Um, and so we have a bunch of different types of work. So some of the things that I do is manage our habitat restoration projects, uh, working with private landowners and grantors to do things like make sure we have good plants, non-invasive plants growing along the streams and keep shade on there. Um, I also uh, get to bring together practitioners and land managers so that we can coordinate our efforts, right? There's a lot of you know, parks agencies and other groups that um, can be a part of stewarding the watershed. And then I also get to do events like this, which is kind of our community engagement piece, having science talks such as this, as well as our Watershed 101 workshop program. Um, let's see, we can go on to the next slide. Um, it's really great to be gathered right here in Multnomah Village for those of us that are in person because Multnomah Village is actually the headwaters of the Tryon Creek watershed. Uh, so all of the little like ditches on the side of the road that we passed by, those trickles actually move through our pipes and our infrastructure and end up becoming Tryon Creek as you know it probably in the state park. So it's neat, it's kind of an upside down situation for urban watersheds to be developed at the top and then have a big natural area right before the confluence, but that's the case for Tryon. And this place has not always been known as the Tryon Creek watershed. So one of the practices that you might be familiar with is land acknowledgements. And so I'm just going to um, honor the folks that have been stewarding this place since long, long before my own ancestors were here. Um, this map shows these different dotted lines are showing the different territories of different tribal groups. And so um, today we're on the lands of the Clackamas Chinook, the Willamette Tumwater, the Wasco Wishram, the Watlada, the Multnomah and other Chinookan peoples. And we are also on the lands of the Tualatin Kalapuya, the Cayuse, the Malala and other tribes and bands of the Columbia and Willamette rivers. So this layer is from our interactive map on our website. We can go to the next slide. I'm going to pick up the pace here. Speaking of urban watersheds, our urban watershed is actually really healthy. Um, it provides uh, good habitat for a healthy cutthroat trout population. This photo is from some U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service doing fish monitoring in Tryon Creek. And they actually found that the cutthroat trout that live in the watershed their population is similar to that of an undisturbed rural area as far as the health of that population goes, which is really cool for uh, an urban watershed to be able to support a healthy fish population. If we go to the next slide, and we're gonna be clicking through a couple photos here. Um, this is a before photo of the Boone's Ferry culvert, which was recently replaced to um, be the Boone's Ferry Bridge which you can see here, that's what it was like before and after, or this is really during, during construction. Um, one more slide will show us with the plants that are growing along the creek. Um, heads up for folks that might've been impacted during construction that some of these boulders shifted in a way that's not so conducive to fish passage anymore because there was a really big storm right after that finished. So they're actually gonna be working on this just a little bit again this summertime um, to make sure that fish can move up beyond this, this um, confluence of Arnold and Tryon Creeks. Next slide is going to show the Highway 43 culvert, which is the biggest fish passage barrier in the Tryon Creek watershed. We have this healthy habitat I just spoke about, but a quarter mile before Tryon Creek meets the Willamette River, it has to pass under Highway 43, which is the implications of that are a 400 foot long culvert that you can see here that is not conducive to fish that um, would like to access the full system. So downstream of this culvert, we have, we see steelhead, we see coho and Chinook salmon, we see lamprey. Uh, and right now, since they can't access Tryon Creek, we're really excited to share that um, this project is underway. It's been two decades of effort minimum to get this project rolling. Um, but the city of Portland, as the non-federal sponsor, are working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they're moving forward with a project to replace this existing problematic culvert 
with an open bottom arch culvert that will allow fish passage up into the system, which is really exciting. There's so many partners involved. This is the kind of stuff. Oh, we're getting a round of applause from the room. Thank you, room. <laughs> um, we can click forward a couple more times. Um, this is just really great because this is this is right downstream of the culvert where the fish sampling was taking place. We know that there are healthy fish eager to be in this cold water. This water is about 12 degrees colder than the Willamette River in the summertime. Um, so it's a cold water and habitat refuge for those migrating fish. So we're really excited to see that coming out possibly in the next few years. These are the kinds of updates that we include in our e-newsletter, um, which goes out about once a month. And so when we wrap today, we're gonna hand out paper surveys and there's gonna be a chance for you to opt in to yes, receive uh, newsletters from the Watershed Council, which come about once a month, sometimes less frequently than that. Um, and uh, yeah, great, that's great. That's just showing more fish survey work down at that confluence space. And um, if we go to the next slide, this is the interactive map that I mentioned on our website. There's a lot of layers to toggle on and off. Um, we can go, I think, to just one more slide. And oh, it looks like we'll click through. So yeah, we wanted to say welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, on March 11th, we will have our big annual volunteer event where folks can get outside and pull ivy and plant trees and contribute to the watershed health. Um, before I hand it over to our Lewis and Clark students, I wanted to thank our funders. Um, this science talk is uh, with thanks and made possible by the City of Portland's Community Watershed Stewardship Program. And I also want to thank West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District who provide partner funding to us that has allowed um, to has allowed me to make this a bit more of an in-depth process. Um, those of you that are here in person tonight, a, a couple of you said, I didn't know there was gonna be pizza. That was a last minute change. So I would be remiss as a very small nonprofit staff person to um, fail to just let you know that we, we wanted to do that to remove the burden of the for the kitchen on the Lucky Lab, right? Placing 40 plus individual orders would have really overwhelmed them. So if you feel inspired to help us balance out those costs, um, we would appreciate donations, no obligation, just wanted to put that one out there, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to our Lewis and Clark students. And I think if you guys wanna to switch towards me just a little bit, I'll switch sides with you. Um, we can go to the next slide, thank you. Yeah, so as Alexis said, we are students from Lewis and Clark College. Um, we are part of an environmental engagement class, and we've been working with Alexis at Tryon Creek Watershed Council to put on this science talk for everyone. So my name is Sylvia. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a biology major and minoring in environmental studies. Um, hi, my name is Bella. I'm a biology and EMDS major, and I use she, her pronouns. Hi, I'm Elliot. I'm a studio art major and a minor in environmental studies, and I use he, they pronouns. Hi, I'm Julia. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an environmental studies major. Um, so in this class, we focus on connecting environmental scholarship with people. Um, in this case, environmental scholarship would be the Emerald Ash Borer's threat to Oregon ash trees and people being community members like yourselves. So to connect this issue with community members, I created the promotional art for this flyer. And as a group, we did outreach by sending emails, sending emails and visiting farmers markets and connecting with community members. All right, and now we would like to introduce state entomologist, Dr. Christine Bull from the Oregon Department of Forestry. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for um, showing up to hear about this terrible, terrible insect. I'll try to put a silver lining on it where I can because it is a bummer. And I'm very sorry to uh, start now your evening this way. Um, so I'm Christine Buell and I'm the state forest entomologist. I work for Oregon Department of Forestry. I work in a forest health unit with a pathologist and basic species person, Wyatt Williams, who um, is also working with me on this effort and an aerial survey specialist. And what we do is we try to help people in urban and wildland environments identify insect disease and abiotic issues. Largely, um, they've been hot, ongoing hot droughts that we've been talking about um, that are stressing our trees on all our different landscapes. We try to diagnose, we try to help others diagnose, 
We try to give management and guide people in a different direction so that we can still see a lot of healthy trees in our landscape. We do a lot of trapping and monitoring, which includes flying an annual forest health survey. So we get in a little plane, we cover every single forested parcel in Oregon, and we map all the damage we see below us. And then we ground truth um, things that are unknown or that we want to follow up on. And all that data is freely available on our forest health page on Oregon Department of Forestry, as is our annual forest health report that we write every year. Um, so today I wanna to talk with you about insects, which I'm actually excited about because I never get to talk about insects anymore. I get to talk about droughts and climate change and things that are setting the stage, stressing our trees. And then the insects that we have that are mostly native, they're just picking off those trees that are stressed opportunistically because healthy trees are defended trees. But when we have something that has not co-evolved with our native trees, then it becomes damaging, such as emerald ash borer, that it can take advantage of even healthy trees. Our trees are not defended against emerald ash borer because they're not used to it. They didn't co-evolve together. So um, this is a new threat in Oregon that we just detected this year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we actually found emerald ash borer for the first time um, in on the West Coast, the first time west of Colorado in Oregon, unfortunately, in Forest Grove, in Washington County. And we found it in the lot of a school in the parking lot. And there are a bunch of ornamental ash. These are not our native um, Oregon ash, um, but ornamental ash, which are commonly planted as street trees and in uh, parks and um, parking lots in other areas in our urban settings. And almost all of these trees were dead or dying. And so we got the call from a city parks employee or a city of Portland employee that knew what emerald ash borer was and was just showing up to pick up his kids. And he said, I think we have EAB. I didn't like getting that text because I knew he knew what he was talking about. And when I showed up here, we had all these trees in various stages of dieback. And then when I got closer, I saw little green beetles flying around in the canopy and D-shaped exit holes right here. And these D-shaped exit holes, I'll show you another picture, but um, they're about the size of if you cut a pencil eraser in half. And they're pretty close to a perfect D-shape. Some look a little messy, um, but that's really a clear indication of emerald ash borer. There aren't a lot of things that make exit holes in ash, um, but there are a few but they don't have D-shaped holes. And so that was a real clear indicator. Um, and then just to verify, I swatted a few with the net, got the adults, they're definitely emerald ash borer. And before you leave tonight, I do have specimens of larvae and adults that you can take a look at, um, or we could pass them around, I don't care, but I will search you if I don't get these back tonight. Um, as if we're not gonna have more and more specimens. Ugh, unfortunately, we're gonna be finding many more. Um, but I want you to get a good look, especially the adults. I'm gonna describe how they are different from other um, of our native beetles that we don't want you out collecting and killing and thinking that they're emerald ash borer. We have a lot of green metallic beetles out there, um, but this one's pretty distinct. And I'll just jump to it right now, since you might see the adult that our uh, emerald ash borer is all over green, no other colors. It's all over green. It's slender and it's smooth. There's no ridges, no bumps, no hairs, none of that. So it's very distinct looking relative to our, some of our native metallic wood boring beetles that might have other colors or lines or be more robust looking. Okay. Um, additionally, when I was at the site, I peeled back the bark and I saw larval galleries. We'll talk more about that. That's another indication that um, emerald ash borer is present because they have distinct larval galleries. So next slide, please. Um, so a little history about emerald ash borer. It is actually from Asia, Eastern Asia and Eastern um, Russia. It arrived um, sometime in North America, we think in the 90s. And we first detected it in 2002 in Detroit, Michigan. Likely it arrived through a very common pathway that wood borers often will arrive by, which is in packing material, wood packing material. That's pallets and crates and other materials like that. Um, that's very common for invasives to come over that way. Um, and then from there, it spread from state to state. And, and um, there was actually a quarantine that was set up around the Mississippi River about, and this insect jumped that quarantine. Likely it traveled interstate through firewood. So inter and intrastate through firewood. And that's also a very common way for wood boring beetles and other types of beetles or wood boring insects to travel is in firewood. 
Um, so that's one of the things, buy it where you burn it. Burn it where you buy it. <laughs> Either one. So um, it did jump that quarantine line and then it kind of held steady and we didn't find it anywhere else. So notice I say we didn't find it, not that it didn't make it anywhere else. So it very well could have traveled in a single log all the way to Oregon and not stopped anywhere along here, but I doubt that's true. It's probably present in other states. We just haven't found it yet. Um, the infestation that I found was um, pretty intense. The Emerald Ash Borer had definitely been doing some work there for at least a couple of years. There was a lot of heavy duty damage. That's very common for an invasive to be lurking in the background and we don't see it until they build up in numbers that we can actually visibly see some damage. Very, very common. So it likely is not confined to Forest Grove. It likely is not confined to Washington County or even Oregon. So we are looking everywhere. We're talking to all of our collaborators within the state and in other states. I'm talking to my counterparts in Washington. We wanna know where else it might be present. Um, so from the 2002 detection initially, um, jumped to 33 states by 2019. And then in 2022, it arrived here. Next slide, please. So the pathways, as I mentioned, getting into the continent, usually it's through shipping. Um, we do have a lot of really great people doing a lot of really hard work looking for things that might be arriving, but there's so much that gets shipped over. They can't find it all. Um, it, it's really hard work. They have to walk throughout these boats and inspect everything. So things get through, um, but they still keep looking and they keep a lot of things out for a long, long time or reduce the number of things that are coming over, but we can't stop them all. And then for travel across states, um, it travels in firewood, but also in nursery stock. And so this is particularly damaging in a county like Washington County, where we have so many nurseries that are providing plants a lot of which are restoration plants, for example, or street trees, and a lot of which are ash. And so this is really problematic because now we have to set a quarantine in that county. And what does that mean for those nurseries? So um, we've got a lot of things we're juggling here. Okay, next slide, please. The damage. Okay, so you can't see this very well, but there are a whole lot of dead trees here. Basically all the ash in this parcel are dead. So. Emerald ash borer is going to be akin to Dutch elm disease um, or uh, chestnut blight or the potato famine, if you want to think outside the box. Um, it will come in and it will kill all of that species because that species is not defended. So what we've seen in other states is over 95% mortality of ash wherever emerald ash borer has been detected. The reason that's not 100% is because there are systemic insecticides that are very effective that are utilized. That is the only reason that they don't kill every single ash tree because they have the ability to do so. Even the healthiest ash tree is still going to be killed by emerald ash borer because our ash trees are not defended against this insect. The healthier the tree, the longer it can stave off that emerald ash borer or withstand or tolerate this, its attack, but they will still die. And so the last estimate is that over 100 million trees have been killed from this insect. Um, it's never been successfully eradicated. So put it out of your mind, two things. It's not only in Oregon on the West Coast, it's likely elsewhere. Second, we will never get rid of it. Other states, states have tried and failed. It's very expensive. It's very laborious. Our efforts are better spent at slow the spread. And so I'll talk to you more about how we're going to do that. But what slowing the spread does is it buys us more time. It reduces the amount of insect on the landscape and um, the amount of insects that travel on the landscape. So it gives us more time to protect areas that we identify that we want to protect with more resources. Um, it also spreads out the cost. When we have infested trees, we don't have a huge glut of trees that we then have to destroy. It kind of spreads it out as this insect will slowly move from one area to another. Um, this insect has very, very high economic ecological costs. So let's get into those. Next slide, please. So on the left, this is Toledo, Ohio. It's an ash line street. Um, and then three short years later, all of those ash are dead. So it can work very quickly. Emerald ash borer can kill a tree in as little as two, sometimes one year if it's already a bit stressed, as are all of our trees in Oregon doing, due to ongoing hot drought. So all of our trees are already stressed. They're already gonna be in bad shape. But this insect can work very fast. 
Um, so this is really devastating, even in an urban environment where these are street trees, um, not really supporting like as rich of a biodiversity of um, wildlife and resources and nutrient cycling that we would see in a wildland setting. But this is a very important habitat because we have heat islands that need that shade. We have a lot of wildlife that's still using these trees in the street. Um, there are people that appreciate these trees. There are aesthetic values, there are property values. And who do you think gets hit the hardest? The neighborhoods or the cities that don't have the budgets to replace these trees. So the neighborhoods that are already underserved, they're gonna lose these canopies and they're not gonna have the budgets to be able to replace them. So those are the ones that we're trying to target the most with um, any of the financial asks that we're putting forth to the legislature. Um, because we need to protect these communities, wildlife and human. Um, these are very essential trees in a lot of urban areas and we want to protect them or we want to be able to provide a replacement as soon as we can. Next slide, please. So just to give you an estimate of ash um, presence in the urban landscape, um, it's actually a very small proportion of trees in a lot of cities, but it is an important proportion of trees. Um, so in Portland, they do actually assess uh, what species are put where and what number. And about 5% of the trees are ash in Portland. That's about 72,000 trees. Now, um, very few of these are actually organ ash. They're non-native ash, um, uh, raywood, I believe, and green ash. Um, but we do have some organ ash in the urban landscape as well. Um, but this is actually taken right down the street, um, right near Terwilliger, and these are all ash trees. And so the estimated cost for removal and replacement of these trees is $50 million. That is a lot of money. And Portland can maybe earmark the budget for this. Now think of a smaller community, a smaller city that doesn't have that budget or maybe has a higher proportion of ash trees. That's gonna be very expensive. So we are working really hard with our interagency task force to try and come up with money so that we can assist these different communities. We don't expect people to just deal with this on their own. Next slide. Um, so this is a heat map that's showing you where ash is present and in what intensity. So um, ash is found typically along waterways. So you'd expect it to be a moister habitat. So it is in the Willamette Valley, particularly in the north. But you also find ash in some very interesting pockets in the southwest, um, maybe some high elevation areas, some areas where we have some ephemeral springs. We do also have some pockets of green ash that have escaped from urban communities into wildland areas. But this is generally where we'll find the majority of our ash trees. Next slide. So Oregon ash is our only native ash species. Um, there are about 16 in North America. Um, or in the US, um, and we just have the one native one, but we do plant, as I said, especially in urban areas, non-native ash as well. Usually they're from the East Coast. Um, and this is an essential tree in our riparian areas. It provides bank stabilization, shading, and wildlife support. And this is especially important when we are trying to protect these waterways and aquatic species because they're under more threats than they ever have been before. I know in the forestry department, we're trying to extend buffers to reduce the ability for people to cut trees closer to the water source. So we keep that shading and that erosion control in the waterways where we need it. And we just updated our rules, which is kind of a huge change that um, hasn't happened in a very long time, extending those buffers to protect those aquatic species. And now we're telling folks, you can't cut in here but now we'll have emerald ash borer come in and kill these trees within these buffers. So we're really struggling on how we're going to deal with that, what we're gonna replace those trees with. Because ash is a very unique tree in that it can withstand having its feet wet half the year and then dry the other half of the year. So they can tolerate two very extreme conditions. Cottonwood can't do it, big leaf maple can't do it, alder, willow, they do not have that ability to withstand those very, very extreme conditions. In some areas, they can replace ash, but not in all areas. So we're really struggling with what do we replace this tree with? Um, and ash is used in the east for a lot of wood products, such as baseball bats, um, organ ash, we do not use for many products. We do have some small mom and pop mills and make flooring and some other specialty products from ash. It's actually a very beautiful wood. We just don't have a lot of market for it. 
That may change with Emerald Ash Borer. We are looking into how we can allocate that material once it's infested and we can actually rid the wood from the beetle. And I'll tell you how we do that. Um, can we still use that wood? So we're looking to try and allocate that wood for other purposes. A key purpose is as a cultural resource. So we are working with tribes to try and determine if there's a way that we can get them wood that's gonna be suitable for their purposes. Ash is prized for paddles, for canoes, um, a variety of other medicines, um, a really important resource for indigenous communities. So we are working with those groups to find the best way so we don't waste their time and their resources on a bunch of wood that's not going to be useful. Um, but we really don't wanna just chip or incinerate all this material when it can actually be used for another purpose. Next slide. So this is a really common site um, in terms of where you often will see ash. So driving down I-5, if you look out amongst our agricultural landscapes, you'll see these pockets or these little islands of broadleaf trees. A lot of times that's 100% ash. This is within the canopy of a pocket like that. This is all ash. So if you have an insect come in and kill all these trees and you don't have a one-to-one -one replacement of another tree that could come in, what are you gonna have there? no more trees. And so whatever water source was there is going to get warmer or it's gonna dry out. Whatever bank stabilization is there is not going to be there. Um, that's gonna be a very important island resource for wildlife and for nutrient cycling and all these other benefits that we're going to lose there. Additionally, what we've seen in other states is that when all those trees are lost, if you don't move very quickly to go into that area and replace those trees, Things like sedges will populate in the understory and they'll actually block out the seed bank so nothing else can come up and you can't dig into it because their roots, roots really dig in and are very fibrous and it's hard to get through those layers. And so we're kind of stuck, what do we do? Um, I will say that when these ash trees die, they're still a valuable resource. They can still be used for nutrient cycling, for nesting, they're still going to be useful. So we are not suggesting to preventatively remove ash on any landscape, urban or um, wildland. Um, unless you have a good reason to do so, we are not advising to do that. Let it ride, wait, wait until Emerald Ash Borer gets closer to you, but be thinking in the back of your mind, what are you gonna replace those trees with? But give them time um, to continue to do what they're doing. Um, we are advising though for restoration projects not to plant ash. Why waste your money? Start thinking about some other species or at least reduce the component of ash that you are out planting. Next slide. Um, so let's do some quick and dirty identification of ash trees because that's where it starts. This insect prefers and does the best on ash. I'll get into some other trees it can get into, but typically it's gonna go after ash. So let's learn how to identify ash. So next slide. Ash has a compound leaf. That means that it has this leaf stem or petiole with a whole bunch of little leaflets connected versus this maple that has this direct stem that's on the leaf just connected to the one versus multiple little ones. Um, it has opposite branching, next slide, which means that the branches are parallel to each other rather than being alternate. Now we do have many non-natives that have this similar layout, but are they bushy instead of tree form? Do they have different bark versus the lattice or diamond shape that ash has. You need to use all of those different features to kind of differentiate if it's ash. In terms of our natives, elderberry is really the only thing I believe that has a compound leaf and opposite branching, but elderberry has very distinct looking leaves. It has very distinct looking fruit and flowers that are different from ash. I didn't show the ash seeds. I think in a later slide I did, but they look very um, distinct. They're kind of just, they look like a canoe paddle. So. The indigenous folks knew what they were talking about when they were um, utilizing this wood for canoe paddles. So you will see those seeds. They look different from elderberry. Also elderberry is often more bush form versus tree form. So there are some ways to parse out what an ash tree looks like. But once you've seen enough ash trees, you know exactly what they look like. And especially when the leaves have dropped as they are now doing, you can see in the distance, some trees that have very, um, I like to call it a pitchfork, even though it resembles nothing like a pitchfork, but the branches just look very symmetrical. And you'll see that in the distance, these very symmetrical branches. So um, once you kind of get a handle on the ash ID, 
start looking for trees once they drop their leaves. And you'll see what I'm talking about when you look at the very top of the uh, canopy against the sky. Next slide. All right, so I mentioned a, um, one lookalike, that was the elderberry. We also have walnut, locust tree, European mountain ash, which is not an ash at all. It has those orange berries um, that birds like. Um, tree of heaven, we don't like that tree. Uh, sumac, um, they all have alternate branching. Even though they have a compound leaf, they have alternate branching, not an ash. Next slide. Okay, um, here's a good look alike. So box elder, um, there are different uh, numbers of leaves that can help, but what really helps are the seeds. And so box elder is a maple. And so it has a maple seed that's a two winged seed versus these single seeds. These are just um, one, they're called Samaras. It's just one seed pod. Next slide. All right, here's the elderberry. Um, has flowers, has berries, it's more shrub-like. Um, so you can pretty much pick those out from ash for the most part, depending upon the time of year. Next slide. Okay, is this an ash? What do you think? All right, great. Because it has flowers and berries, which um, ash does not. Next slide. Oh, I guess I should have mentioned, okay. Folks online, if you didn't hear the answer. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, let's let them answer before we verbally do. Let's really test them. All right. Boop. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> Um, uh, ooh, some folks online failed. <laughs> All right, better review. Okay, this is not an, a true ash tree because it has berries and it has flowers. It does not look like our true ash. This is mountain ash. There we go. All right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the insect itself. Finally, we get to talk about insects. That's what I'm here for. Okay, as I mentioned, it's from Eastern Asia and Eastern Russia. It's a wood boring type of beetle. We have lots of different types of beetles. Some just get under the bark, some get into the wood. Even though this is called a wood boring beetle, it doesn't get into the wood that deeply. It really does hang out underneath the bark and it girdles the trees, making these larval galleries. And I'll, in the next slide, I'll walk you through the whole process of life. Um, so when they are doing this, they girdle trees, which means they're cutting off vascular tissue. So if you think about trees and their wood, at least the outer rind of their actual wood underneath that bark, that outer rind, those are like a network of straws that the trees are using to um, bring up nutrients and moisture and translocate it throughout the tree. Very important. But this insect will cut off those tissues and it takes a long time for trees to rebuild. They can't fix, they have to rebuild those tissues. This is also happening when we drought stress trees. Those tissues can snap. And so the tree takes a long time to rebuild those tissues. In the meantime, it's really thirsty. So it's kind of the same process. Basically, this is cutting off the veins of the tree. So it can kill a tree very, very quickly. So this insect prefers ash. As I mentioned, it can get into some other trees, other trees within the Oleaceae family, which is the olive family. So it can get into cultivated olive, fringe tree, although it does not prefer those as much as it prefers ash and feeding trials, and it doesn't do well developmentally on those materials. We are still alerting cultivated olive growers because that's a burgeoning industry in the Willamette Valley to be on guard that once all of our ash is gone, these beetles may go after cultivated olive. We don't know. Um, they just don't do as well as uh, on that material as ash. So who knows, when we see the end of all ash, maybe we'll see that all the end of uh, emerald ash borer, but we all won't be alive to see it. So it doesn't matter. Next slide. Oh, actually go back one slide, would you please? Thank you. I'm gonna show this again, but this is how small the beetle is. For those of you online, I passed it around. If you were here, you would have gotten to see it, but don't worry, you'll see it in the coming years. So it's a little smaller than a penny, very slender. Next slide. 
In entomology, we always show really big blown up pictures of insects. People are like, oh my God, it's a foot long. So I always try to note that these are very small things we're looking for. Okay, so here's the cycle. Now the timing, don't pay attention to it as much because we don't know how this insect will behave in Oregon. It really varies a little bit based on the climate um, and the different locations, but generally emerald ash borer has a life cycle that lasts one year from egg to adult. It can last two years in colder climates where it just takes more time to feed um, as a larval stage. So what it does is the adult will lay eggs on the outside of the tree. Those eggs hatch into little bitty larvae or um, grubs. And then they will actually burrow underneath the bark and they'll make these serpentine galleries. So one larva will just snake back and forth and this gallery gets wider um, because the insect is getting bigger because they molt and they get fatter as they feed. Then they pupate and they'll actually kind of wiggle their way out towards the bark. Um, it depends, it really varies how deeply they'll stay in the sapwood, the outer edge of the sapwood, or they'll get into the bark. But they do this weird thing. So they turn into pre pupae and they fold their bodies in half. Imagine if you did this and then you developed in a totally different being that looks different. That's weird, right? Insects are weird. So this is a pre pupa, it hairpins back and then it turns into this thing. So very interesting thing that this insect does. And then in the spring, it'll come out, spring, summer, it'll come out as an adult, nibbles on leaves a little bit, and then it mates, lays eggs, dies. Cycle begins anew. Next slide. Okay, as I mentioned, emerald ash borer um, does look similar to some of our natives. So I wanna point out some features. Even with pointing out these features, we'll still all confuse it with some things. Um, I will confuse it with some things until I get it under a microscope. So, but for the most part, you can tell with the naked eye if it's even close to emerald ash borer because it's all over green. Um, a lot of our other insects have a few other colors. This is the golden depressive, very common native, present on the landscape, despite what you read online. It's not a pest, don't worry about it. Please don't kill them. Um, there's orange and yellow. They also have ridges. Um, some of these other things have some spots and some bumps. Um, this insect is very, very smooth. So emerald ash borer, smooth, all over green. Um, what else do I need to remember? I think that's it. Okay. Um, ODA has a really great um, lookalike sheet and the resources are at the end of this slide or at the end of this PowerPoint. Um, that's a really useful guide because they really pulled out the major things that people will look at and go, oh, I think that kind of looks like emerald ash borer. Some aren't beetles because sometimes, you know, we aren't entomologists and we don't know what's a beetle and what's not. So they did put some things on there that look very obviously different because um, they just really want to prevent getting any false, as many false reports as we can. Next slide. Okay. People here, don't say anything. Folks online, see this brown beetle. Do you think it's emerald ash borer? You're, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm counting three, two, one. All right, folks in the room, what do you think this brown beetle, is it emerald ash borer? No. Okay, so emerald ash borer, it's green. It can look less bright green and less beautiful. Some look a little drab, um, but this is actually a beetle that we commonly see in birch. It's native um, bronze birch borer, but it looks very similar to emerald ash borer because they're very closely related. Okay, next slide. Oh. Bronze birch borer, bronze, okay, you can keep clicking. Okay, oh, and also if you find it on a tree that's not ash, it could be sunning itself, but um, if you see a whole bunch of beetles and it's not an ash tree, probably not emerald ash borer. Okay, now folks online, does this big fat beetle with lines on it, is it emerald ash borer? You guys are doing great. 
You, yeah, you are getting worse though. <laughs> okay, counting down. Three, two, one. What do you guys think? No, because it's got lines. And if you saw emerald ash borer right next to this insect, emerald ash borer would be like this wide. So it's less robust. Um, okay, you can click through these wide ridges. Okay. All right, now we are going to look at some exit holes. So I didn't give you enough details ahead of time, but remember I mentioned that they have D-shaped exit holes. Now, beetles make very clean holes as if you took a drill and it has nice perimeters versus woodpeckers that are kind of sloppy. Um, and there are a lot of things that can make holes in trees and ash, there's things that can make holes in trees, um, but the D-shape is very distinct. So I'm gonna show you this sloppy mess over here that's in a row, how nicely planned those beetles coordinated. Um, and then these really big round holes. Is it emerald ash borer? Okay, I wanna get this thing moving along. So three, two, one. Okay, now don't say anything. Is this emerald ash borer? What do you think this is? Does anybody know? Do you know what kind of woodpecker? Sap sucker. Awesome. So sap suckers, they go after sap. They might eat a beetle or two that get in the sap, but they're really going after sap and they just go, wait, go back. Peck, 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 peck in a line. So that row, Insects don't do that. They don't coordinate that well. And it's sloppy. They're not, they're not like nice, perfectly um, round holes. Okay, this one, this is not emerald ash borer. Why? Round holes, and they're really big. Um, so remember, think of like half an eraser, just cut it in half. And I wish I had samples to show you in person. Um, we didn't have very good ones, but you can see there's a bit of variation. This one looks a little bit more round than this one, but if you see an ash tree that's not looking so good, and a whole bunch of holes, some of which look D-shaped and they're all kind of in the same area, it's likely emerald ash borer and you should definitely report it to us. Next slide. Okay, so um, the first thing you wanna do is assess, is it an ash tree? Second, what are the symptoms? Does it have symptoms? Now remember, all of our trees are really stressed and ash gets hit by a lot of different things. There's a lot of foliar insects that are aesthetic problems and, and the leaves can look kind of crummy. But if you see an ash tree that has um, crown thinning or some top kills, so just dieback of leaves that start from the top or epicormic shoots, that just means branches where the crown isn't. So on the stem or at the base, you might wanna take a closer look and then you look for those D-shaped exit holes. You may also see bark splits because the insect, when it's girdling back and forth, it's pushing the bark away from the wood and it creates space. And sometimes it splits the bark open. You may also see woodpecker flecking because the woodpeckers can hear them wiggling around in there and they shave off the bark and they pull them out. We see this in the east. We'll see if our woodpeckers get on the stick and, and learn about emerald ash borer and can pick them out. And then we'll see that symptom. But really the key ones, Look for thinning, epicormic shoots, D-shaped exit holes. Those are gonna be your key. Next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna go through some questions. Um, when should you versus not report um, if there's potential emerald ash borer infestation? We wanna know everything. We just don't have enough staff to follow up on everything. So we're really trying to be very clear in what the ask is of you when you're looking around on the landscape. So if it's not ash, don't report it to us, unless we're asking you to look for one of the other million things that are out on the landscape. But for tonight, we're just asking for ash. Um, cultivate all of our fringe tree, possibly, if you see something funky, but really let's concentrate on the ash. Is it an ash tree? Does it look sick? You want, is this an actual pole? Yes, it's a pole. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Okay. All right. Okay. Should you report it if it's not an ash? You guys, you're giving them the answers. <laughs> All right. If it's a healthy looking ash, should you report it? You can say, okay, no, okay. 
Okay, great. Um, uh, if it's an ash tree with a thinning crown, dieback, epicormic shoots, but it has no exit hole, should you report it? Need more information, awesome. Maybe if you don't see those exit holes, we might wanna know about it. Use your best judgment. This is a really hard one because we have a lot of ash that aren't looking good and we don't have time to ground truth all of them. So just, you know, if you're seeing a whole bunch of ash in an area that are looking bad, you might wanna report it. If you see one ash, maybe let that one go. Um, okay, if you see a green beetle with gold or orange coloration, do you wanna report it? No, it's not emerald ash borer. Um, if you don't have the location of, a tr of the tree. Do you know how many reports I've gotten? I saw a green beetle last week, it flew away. What do we do? Please give us something to go on. Give us a picture, give us the location, give us a specimen. Like we need some help to follow up on this. We're not gonna just show up and, and search around your neighborhood for this thing that you found. We don't have time. Um, I saw a green beetle, no specimen. No, you just heard me rant about that. Okay, don't have a picture of the tree or the beetle. You can report it if you want, whether or not we take the time to follow up. Like, do you want us to actually follow up? Then please do a little bit of legwork. Okay. We don't need to look at the poll. I'm sure they're doing great. All right. Next slide, please. Oh. <laughs> Let's see if I failed. No, details. I will get to that, but I'll just tell you really quick. Um, we do have an online hotline is the Oregon Invasive Species Online Hotline that you can put a lot of information, upload pictures, locations. That's where you report it. The link is in the end of the presentation. Next slide. Okay, so we knew that emerald ash borer was gonna get here. We knew it was a matter of time. We saw it sweeping through states. Um, we've seen this with other insects. So we had plans in place. No matter how much planning you do, you never are fully prepared. Um, I think all the entomologists in the state were hoping that we'd all be retired by the time it got here, but no such luck. Um, so from 2013 to 2016, we got funding from APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service to set traps. These big purple prism traps are also some funnel traps with lures to try and attract emerald ash borer so that we can find them more easily. They don't come to these traps super readily. Also, these are a sticky mess and I don't miss hanging them, so great. Um, we don't utilize them as much anymore. Also, the beetle will come in and smell a lure and go, oh, but that's an ash tree. I'm gonna go there instead. Also, these are really hard to inspect all the time that is there an emerald ash borer that arrived this week? Um, and it's wasteful. You can only use it for one season. So we did do a lot of trapping. We placed over a thousand traps. We are gonna continue trapping in some select areas, but really the way this insect is almost always first detected and found in new areas is through visual observation. Somebody goes, that's not right. Something doesn't look good. So we created the um, Oregon Forest Pest Detectors. That was an OSU led effort um, in 2015. It um, created a platform where there's online trainings, which are free. The link is in later slides. Um, and it's not just for emerald ash borer, it's for Asian longhorn beetle, gold spot beetle, all, gypsy moth, lots of other insects, but there is an emerald ash borer module. Um, it's going to be ongoing. It will always be there online for free. If you want credits, you have to pay a small fee, I believe. Um, but we've trained over 500 people with this online course and then had them come to field sessions where we would replicate signs and symptoms in a park so that they can actually see what it would look like on the landscape. Now we can take them to actual infested sites with emerald ash borer, so that's great. Um, but this is gonna be ongoing. Um, and then we had a response plan that we finalized in 2021. So we started working on it several years before that. It's built on the plans from multiple other states um, because we wanted to learn what they did right, what they did wrong, what they wish they did, and they were more than willing to share. And it's awesome. We talk to them constantly um, about, um, as we're progressing, about what we should do and how we should do it. Um, this response plan is very general though, and it's available online, you can read it. And it's really mainly um, setting templates that when it's found, what do we do? Who do we contact? What are their roles? So that when Emerald Ashford did arrive here, an agency that was tasked with something couldn't go, 
we don't have time or staff or budget to do this, so no thank you. No, they had to. We all knew exactly what our roles were going to be, and we could work that much faster together. Um, and I think the most interesting thing is um, Wyatt Williams, our invasive species specialist for ODF, started this project um, in 2019 where he started collecting ash seed from throughout the range of ash in Oregon. And he just completed it, or he's completing it this year, collecting over a million seeds. And what he's doing is collecting all those seeds. They're going to a cold repository. We're working with the Forest Service to retain that seed so that we don't lose the genetic diversity of the species. We want to keep it on our landscape wherever we can. We can put it back on our landscape in some areas and maybe treat it with uh, systemic insecticide so that we can still retain it in those areas. And we're going to be working on resistance trials to determine if somehow we can find some organ ash that are more resistant than others um, to emerald ash borer. Next slide. And then once it got here, what did we do? So a temporary quarantine is going to go into effect um, in the next week or so. And that's led by ODA, which is the regulatory agency in the state for uh, pests. Um, and it's going to be set, I believe, just in Forest Grove, not the entirety of Washington County, but I could be wrong about that. Um, that may change. And what that's saying is no ash going in or out. We don't want emerald ash borer spreading within that area, but more importantly, not spreading out from that area. This is temporary because we need to figure out what are our next steps, especially for the nurseries that are within that area that have all this ash stock. We don't wanna hurt their business. So we need to figure out what's the best way to move forward. Um, we're, we have ongoing monitoring for new infestations. That's what this map is, determining, oh, these red trees, they're definitely infested. Um, these green trees or yellow trees, we're not sure, we're gonna keep monitoring them. Gray trees, no, not infested yet. We're working our way out from the epicenter. Um, a lot of agencies are working on that effort. And we can look for this year round, even though the leaves are dropping on the trees, we can look for D-shaped exit holes. We can peel back bark, larva are under there. We can still detect if emerald ash borer is present. And as we're doing this, we're determining what are the best sites for biocontrol release. We're gonna be releasing two or three parasitoid wasps that are very effective at controlling emerald ash borer. This is not a silver bullet. Biocontrol rarely can eradicate. It's just going to reduce the population, therefore reduce the spread of the insect. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of subcommittees dealing with um, the whole complex of the, the issues that are gonna come about when we have more trees that are dying from emerald ash borer. So the survey and monitoring subcommittee, and we meet um, every few weeks, we have so many emerald ash borer meetings. So all the questions that you have in your mind, we are talking about them, we have discussed them. We just haven't put some things into action yet because it takes time. We wanna make sure we put out the correct guidance and we wanna make sure that we can actually do the things that we say that we're gonna do. So we are getting there. Um, and then wood waste utilization, that's a big one. What are we gonna do with all this material? Paddles, biochar, a fuel for gasification systems. We don't have to just chip and burn it. Um, we're doing a lot of training and technical assistance, um, integrated pest management, that's the biocontrol research, looking at resistance, some other, um, other things on the horizon there. Communication, our public affairs team has been fantastic getting the word out, creating materials that we can advertise this issue. Um, and then funding, that's perhaps the biggest one. How do we pay for this? This is gonna be very expensive. Next slide. Okay, so preventative actions. What do we do right now if you have ash trees? So take stock of your ash trees. How many do you have? Uh, monitor their health. Be aware of where emerald ash borer is present. We're saying go by county. You don't need to know it's within five miles, 10 miles. This insect spreads on average about 10 miles a year. And so knowing it's about 10 miles away helps you gauge and it takes at least a couple years for it to infest a tree until it can kill a tree. Um, but I would say just go by county. So we're in Multnomah County, Washington County is right next door. It's gonna be maybe a year or two before it gets here. It's like 20 miles away. So um, think about it in, in, in those terms. If you live in Josephine County, maybe you've got a lot more time if Emerald Ash Borer isn't present closer to you. Um, remember that healthy ash trees will die less quickly, but they will still die. Um, and then avoid planting ash if at all possible. If you are going to plant ash, consider systemic insecticide. There are lots of different insecticide products. ODA has a nice table on their site that lists them. 
Um, but really the systemics are the best for not hitting as many non-targets. And I say as many because you're still going to have non-target impacts. If you use a soil drench or a granular, it's still getting into the soil, even though it's being up ta um, taken up by the tree, it's still getting into the soil where there are a lot of insects that live, including we have many, many ground nesting bees. They pick up those granules, they take them back to the hive or you're dumping right into their nesting ground. And these are broad spectrum insecticides. So stem injection is really best. Realize it's still gonna kill all the insects that are within that tree. So um, really weigh those options. We do suggest amamectin benzoate, even though it's a broad spectrum insecticide, kills a lot of things. Um, it's very effective. It lasts for three years. Um, it's, it's worked very well, but um, apply it judiciously. And then realize if you treat in year one and you don't treat in year four, that could be the year that your tree gets hit. So it's a long-term um, thing that you're signing up for. Um, don't move firewood at all. Um, the rules say don't move firewood within Oregon. Um, don't move any firewood into Oregon. Within Oregon, don't move firewood more than 50 miles. We are kind of sticking with on the EAB task force, don't move it more than 10 miles since that's the normal spread of emerald ash borer per year. I say don't even move it. Just buy it at your campsite. Buy it as close to your campsite as possible. There's no need to truck around wood. And if you're going to do so, know what ash bark looks like and don't bring ash. Okay, treatment, um, chip or masticate. So grind that stuff up or you can kiln dry 60 for 60. So at 60 minutes at 60 degrees Celsius that kills pretty much everything in even the thickest piece of wood. You can incinerate or burn it up. Um, you can fumigate. We don't suggest that. Usually it's methyl bromate, which is really toxic and it's really expensive. You have to case it in plastic. We don't really advise that. Um, but there are a lot of different products we can utilize it for, such as biochar. So we're really trying to work hard on not wasting all this material because there are only so many places that need a bunch of chip in their pathways. Next slide. Um, best treatments. Oh, these are questions. Okay. What are the best treatments? Would you say we need to preemptively remove all the uninfested ash, as expensive as that might be. I'm gonna have you guys just answer. What do you think? Should we do that? No, let's just let them ride. Let's uh, tackle the ones that actually are infested. Let's not do everything at once. Um, also, even if you replace a tree, um, this big, healthy, growing tree, you're not gonna put in a tree of similar size or uh, that's collecting as much carbon immediately. So let that tree live some more, keep collecting carbon, stay in the landscape before you put in a smaller tree that might be taking in more carbon on a rate scale, but it's really not overall taking as much carbon as that tree was. Um, okay, should we plant more ash? Let's give the beetles more food. No, probably not. Um, Let's save our money and our resources. Um, should you spray heavily infested trees with insecticide? Oh, I didn't mention um, the insecticides are only preventative. So if a tree is infested, should you put insecticide on it? No. And if you Google online, it will say that even the emamectin benzoate, if a tree has like 20% canopy loss, you can still treat and protect the tree. That might be true in some cases but not all, and I would say don't waste your money. If you see any dieback or thinning of the crown, don't waste your money on insecticide. That tree is just, you're, that's a loss. Um, okay, should you be aware of International Society of Arborists certified? We can trust them, arborists in your area, because you're gonna need to call somebody, right? And I always point people here because these folks typically, uh, they take a lot of coursework. They know a bit more than your average Joe. Um, so be aware of who to call if you need to destroy some material. And then um, should you wait and see? Um, just watch your ash and just see how it goes before you do anything? That's what I would do. I'd let it ride. Okay, next slide. I hate tests, don't you? Like, I really feel bad for test takers. Okay, um, all right, in summary. So Emerald Ash Borer currently has only been found in Washington County, doesn't mean it's only there, but we are looking actively and you can help us 
Um, we definitely want people to tell us if they see something funky on the landscape, especially if it's outside of Washington County. Um, the infestations can spread about 10 miles a year on average. Now, if you have um, scattered ash, the infestations are gonna spread further faster because they're actively seeking food. But the beetle doesn't wanna fly any further than it has to. It may not fly more than the next tree over. It might lay eggs right on the tree it came out of. So they don't wanna travel far. Um, avoid planting ash, just save your money, plant something else and diversify when you are out planting. Um, and also think about climate change and how that species you're putting on the landscape is going to do. Monitor your ash for signs and symptoms of infestation. That's thinning crown, epicormic shoots, D-shaped exit holes. And then report the potential infestations to the online hotline. Please include images and locations. Next slide. Whew, we did it. All right, here's all the resources. Please take advantage of these. There's so many more on the ODA website, on the ODF website, OSU. We all have websites with lots of links but I really want to pare it down to the most important ones. Um, and then this PDF can be made available through Alexis, I think, putting her on the spot. And I think, I think that's it. I think that's the last slide. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, for folks on Zoom, we are going to take questions from you and alternating with folks that are in person. And um, I guess we'll start with the Zoom question. We'll start with an in-person question. All right, um, right there. Uh, thank you for the talk. Thanks. What keeps the beetle in check in Asia? Good question. So where this insect, oh, what keeps the beetle in check in Asia? Um, so, where it's native, it has a lot of other predators and parasitoids that are that co-evolved with it, can recognize it. Um, there are some specialists that can really focus on it versus out here, we have generalists that are going, oh, what's, what are you? Do you taste good? Um, so there are a lot of natural controls there. Also, more importantly, the trees co-evolved with the insect and they have chemical defenses that can protect them against this beetle unless they're stressed. So it's the same thing here where we have healthy trees, they're well defended, but if they're stressed, even our native insects can kill them, they finish them off. Same system over there. So chemical defenses, natural enemies. Um, there will probably be questions later about why don't we move those trees here? So I'm just gonna answer that now. Um, Manchurian ash is the main um, native tree that emerald ash borer is familiar with. It has defenses against emerald ash borer. If we were to move that tree over here, it's off site, meaning it's not from here, it's not used to this place, and it may not perform as well. It's gonna be inherently more stressed. That's gonna still make it susceptible to emerald ash borer. And it's a very slippery slope um, transferring species. We don't do that lightly. Okay, um, Zoom question. Yeah, no, not, um, we, no, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so does emerald ash borer um, kill 100% of olive, olive trees or olive family? The olive family, no. So it really focuses on ash number one, secondarily cultivated olive and fringe tree. Um, really not a whole lot else has been done feeding trial wise and develop both and development wise. Um, on other species of the olive family because I think we're less concerned about those species. So there just isn't money for funding for that. Um, but really it's those three, but ash is like the key one. So don't worry about the other ones. We need to focus on ash um, in person. Yes. Yeah, so more detailed maps of ash distribution. Yes, so that one um, I show because it has uh, positively identified like lat longs of individual ash trees that we built that from. The Forest Service has species parameter maps that um, they're finer grain, but also they include more areas than our map includes. But what they are built on are models based on what um, habitat that species prefers. 
and also some ground checks through their FIA program, their forest in inventory analysis program, um, where they go out on the landscape and they mark, what is this tree? How is it doing? They do that every year um, in some areas. And so they've confirmed that ash definitely is here next and it's overlaid with the models of ash should be here. So it gives you more information whether or not it's 100% accurate. It's not. Um, ours is 100% accurate, but it's smaller. And you actually can, ours is very fine because you can go to that specific tree um, and we can make that available and we are making that available to cities, but it doesn't include every single ash in the area. So there's really no map that identifies where every single ash tree is. We are working with LIDAR um, and some change recognition software to determine can we determine through um, satellite imagery, is it an ash tree? And then can we determine, is it stressed or is it infested? But that's gonna be years down the road. And it, it, it's really hard to train the systems to learn that this is an ash tree versus another broadleaf tree. Okay, Zoom question. Yeah, um, someone said they've heard that young ash trees are not susceptible to the Emerald ash borer will attack young and old trees, but it will typically get into trees that are at least one inch diameter. Even a one inch diameter tree though, doesn't have a ton of real estate for its brood. So not a lot of ash or emerald ash borer will be produced from that tree, but it can get into some pretty small material. Okay, yes. Yeah, there is a, um, a tipping point for when you would want to start treating a tree with systemic insecticide if you see some dieback, and that's that 20% crown loss that I mentioned, but I would not advise it. Don't waste your money um, because it's, it's really a 50-50 chance that it'll live versus not. Yeah. That's a really good comparison. So yes, with bronze birch borer, which is native, um, we will look at a percentage of crown dye back and go, you can still treat it to kill the insect. Now, even if those birch trees aren't native, it's a native insect. It's not gonna be as dramatic of an um, impact as emerald ash borer. And so that's why I'd say emerald ash borer, don't even risk it, bronze birch borer, maybe risk it. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you chip up your ash tree at least like an inch um, chip width, you're, you're going to get rid of the emerald ash borer. Even if it's a bit larger chip, the material is destroyed. It's dried out. If any lived, it would be a miracle. So you can use it on your landscape. There is some advice also to cover your materials, your trees or your chip with plastic. I say don't waste your time or money or don't put more plastic on the landscape. These beetles chew through wood. They can chew through plastic. A lot of the studies with wrapping stuff in plastic, a solarization studies take place in the American Southwest where it's hot and the beetles get baked before they can like figure out that they can fly towards the plastic and chew their way out. Those, that doesn't happen here. They, I've stood there and I've watched beetles chewing through plastic that was covering slash. And so don't waste your time with solarization or covering materials of plastic, unless you don't have anything else, um, anything else you can do to treat very quickly. Some people will just put a tarp over material until they can get to it. If that's all you can do, that's all you can do. But I would say don't focus your effort, efforts there. Um, okay, in person, I'll go to the back. Yes. Okay, so how would we replace the ash islands? Um, what species will we replace with and how quickly will we do it? Um, I would say move really quickly in terms of what you're planting, maybe even under planting, um, under stuff that isn't infested yet. 
Um, in terms of what species to plant with, OSU is coming up with a very comprehensive list and it will range if this is a drier type site, a wetter type site, this elevation, this aspect, this part of the state, they're going to really drill down on what species to plant. But I mentioned a few, so red or white alder in some drier areas, um, willow, cottonwood, ugh, we all hate it, but that's one. Um, big leaf maple, uh, Oregon white oak actually does great in a lot of ash areas, even if they're wet. Um, uh, valley pine, if it's uh, wetter, um, Doug fir even. We don't suggest western red cedar, especially folks in Southwest. We have a western red cedar mapping project. A lot of dying western red cedar. That range is moving and shrinking because it's just too hot. It's too dry for that species, except for out of shaded, um, moist habitat. So I would avoid that one. I would say whatever you plant, diversify. Don't replace it all with another species. Don't plant a ton of walnut, and then we get thousand uh, cankers disease and all the walnut, and then that's all gone. And, um, diversify and really think about climate change. That these are not annual crops; they live decade upon decade. Think of where our climate was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Think about where it's going to be 10, 20, 30 years in the future and plant appropriately. I have to jump to Zoom and then I'll come back to. And, yeah, that's okay. Um, is there work for the age that they're taking now to check the book one about the age of the plant? Is it worth removing a tree as soon as you know it's infested but before it dies? Sure. If you have the ability to do so, because then you can possibly reduce the infestation level at that small area on the landscape. Um, don't be thinking that if we went in and we did chip all of those trees, by the way, that we first found Emerald Ash Borer in Forest Grove, it happened the very next day. Don't be thinking that then we took care of the problem because we then saw other trees that were infested. So we could go in there and just bomb Forest Grove with insecticide and try and eradicate Emerald Ash Borer. It's not going to happen because however it got to the state, it's going to keep coming into the state. It's going to keep populating some adjacent areas. So realize that you can locally reduce the population, but more will come. Okay, in person. Did you want to ask your question? Sure, because it speaks to the- That's what I figured. The, Go for it. To the, and this is abstract because it goes back. Um, is there an opportunity for land managers to use prescribed fires in area? In areas where there are ash groves or ash woodlands, and then move toward more indigenous historic landscapes like uh, Kamek and yeah. wet prairie environments that are tragically also understood in the land. Yeah, so is this an opportunity that we can possibly use tools such as prescribed fire to preventatively manage for a variety of different things in those areas? I would say absolutely. And that's one of the things that we as government agencies were getting slightly better at working with tribes and learning some of the ways that uh, lands have been managed rather than thinking we know how it's going to be done and we're going to tell you how it's going to be done and we can help you help us the conversation has become slightly more slightly more two-way in which we are learning more about okay maybe some of these methods that we've been utilizing for years are not quite working um i would hazard though that restoration doesn't necessarily mean send it back to exactly the way it used to be because our conditions have changed, but utilize those tools, especially prescribed fire. We definitely want to put that back in the landscape. Fire is natural. It's normal at the proper cycles, the proper intensity. We've just let it run out of control because we've done so much suppression of it in areas where we just didn't know what else to do, didn't have a lot of resources. And then when it comes, it really comes. So yes, we definitely want to use this opportunity to employ a variety of tools and maybe replace these landscapes back to um, the ways that they, how they used to be or ways that they, or not ways, but um, a species composition uh, and complexity that's going to serve future uh, climate change conditions in particular. Okay, Zoom. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Great. Heck yeah. And the question what what? Oh man. So okay, so what wildlife will be impacted um on the landscape scale? 
birds, big time, rodents. Um, however, a lot of rodents like fallen wood. So when these trees die and fall over, we'll see an uptick in certain rodents that really like that. Um, bees nest in wood material. We have over 600 species of bees in this state, upwards of 800 that we just haven't class uh, classified taxonomically just yet. Um, and a lot of them are ground or wood nesting. And so they utilize this. Beetles that are great predators for a lot of other things. We forget about all the different natural controls we have that have to live somewhere. Um, so a lot of insects, a lot of birds, reptiles, rodents, a lot of things are going to be impacted, including other animals, us. So very, very important. Um, I mentioned that this is an important riparian tree. It's protecting a lot of our aquatics, so our, our fish. Um, we're really focusing on salmonids, but we have a lot of frogs and salamanders, et cetera, that are being supported by the shading provided by these trees. And so um, pretty much there's no one um, group that's going to be most affected. It's all going to be equally affected in a really bad way, unless we um, can replace those habitats in a way that can still uh, suit those um, ecosystems. Okay, do we have more? Yes. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So money, where are we getting it? So probably the biggest are the um, recent uh, presidential allotted infrastructure funds. At ODF, we've already earmarked a ton of it for Emerald Ashbore and we're using it right now. So um, funding that was already in place before we even found this thing that all the agencies are getting a bit up to rebuild. Um, that's already being utilized. Um, OWEB monies, anything dealing with water, we can tap those funds. Um, Forest Service has a lot of funding, um, anything. We are, we're tackling everything. And some of it's for research, some of it's for on the ground monitoring, some of it's for outreach and education. So there are a lot of different pots of money, big and small, that all of our agencies are looking into. Um, I'm not working on that as much, so that's all I can speak to on that. I'm only doing the ground stuff and the outreach stuff. Um, and then in terms of um, what you can do, you can give me your card and then I can connect you with the right people. But in your area, Clean Water Services has been huge. City of Forest Grove has been huge. They are part of our task forces. They've been very helpful and communicative. They're doing tons of monitoring. So if you have groups, even citizen science groups that can conduct monitoring and citizen science in public spaces, not private properties, and um, we can work out a system so that you can add stuff to our survey one, two, three, that's gonna be great. We need as many people on the ground looking as possible and reporting and then sharing these resources, sharing this outreach, putting these links on your site, putting it in your um, newsletters, like getting people aware of it. Because even though it's my world right now, I'm realizing it's not everybody's world. People have other lives. There are things more important than entomology out there. And so getting it on at least their dashboard a little bit. So they're thinking about it and they go, hey, isn't that an ash tree? Okay, and then maybe another thing will come up and they'll think, oh yeah, I'm supposed to look at that. And then maybe the third, fourth time, they'll take a look at some of this stuff. So spreading that information is going to be really useful. All right. Yes. Okay. So air curtain burners are really cool and we have utilized them. Um, I wish I could explain to you the night. We've got arborists in here. You want to explain what an air curtain burner is doing other than just cooking something? It's just cooking something. All right. So it's basically high. Sure. Let's see what Google has to say. Okay. So it cooks and burns the S out of something. All right, thank you. So um, 
Basically, these are typically really big, expensive systems. We use them for sudden oak death in Southern Oregon. If you've heard of it, it's a disease that's just killing a lot of tan oak. Um, pretty intensive, very expensive. And now we got this thing. So um, very expensive, uh, laborious things. But we use those air curtain burners to sanitize an area. It kills all the disease in that material, in that spot. Now, historically, these were big, expensive machines. Now they have portable air curtain burners, and we've accessed them, and we will be taking them to staging locations in Washington County so people on the larger scale can take the material, dump it off there, and destroy it, and um, get rid of the emerald ash borer so that that wood can be allocated elsewhere or it's safe. So we are coming up with those staging areas right now. Yes. That's a great question, and I'm so embarrassed working for Oregon Department of Forestry that I don't know. Um, 60 to 80 years. 250, maybe. Max, that's actually, wait a second. I remember looking at this on our fact sheet, and that's really high. On, and so uh, let's say 100 years. Um, but obviously, if it's healthier, it can keep going. If the site is poor, you may have a very old but skinny tree. A lot of variability there. I'm an entomologist, not a silviculturist. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know all there is about trees. OK, OK. So let's go with the local knowledge here. So 80 years. Yes. Do um, what about forest fires? I got the rest of it except for the very first word. Oh, conifer forest fires. Got it. Okay. Um, ooh, I have to think about that one. Um, there are a lot of different avenues there that if you had wildfire. This could be complicated and this might get all over the place, but if you had proper wildfire, it goes in, it cleans up an area a bit, takes out some competing trees and allows for more moisture on the site, allowing the trees that withstand the fire a little bit more moisture and they can become more vigorous and healthier in the landscape. So then they can withstand and we ash for maybe a bit longer and they'll still die from it. If you have wildfire sweep through, we've had it sweep through pest areas such as mountain pine beetle attacked areas. And we go, well, the beetle problem isn't going to be very high there anymore because all the trees are gone. So there's those positive impacts. Um, can't really think of too many negative impacts other than when a tree is damaged by wildfire but then doesn't die, it's then more stressed and less defended. And so the beetles can kill that um, tree more readily. Um, wildfire is not as yet um, outside of the North Cascade complex that we had a couple years ago, not as an intense of a stressor in the range of ash as it is in other parts like the far Southwest, Central and Northeast Oregon where we have the highest intensity of wildfire damage. Um, but that's obviously changing with climate change as we see more of wildfire sweeping into our urban areas. So that remains to be seen. There's a lot of different, um, it's ecologically complex. Yes. You know about the emerald ash No. Okay. <laughs> Then you don't need to watch this. <laughs> yeah, so we, like I said, we did learn a lot from those different states and um, it's ongoing our conversations with them about what do we do? How do we do it? Um, citizen science has been huge. So a lot of the ideas that we came up with, such as our training program, getting folks that are on the ground that, um, can learn to identify potential infestations. That's, we stole that stuff. They already did that. That stuff worked. And so we utilized it. Um, things that didn't work, eradication efforts, um, trying to treat with insecticide when the tree was too far gone. Those were things that we learned the communities tried and didn't work. So especially the cities that 
tried large scale eradication efforts and didn't work, we learn from those communities, not even to waste our time with it. Um, so little things here and there, um, and then some more finer uh, specific details about resistance breeding, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, has oh we we've only found them in uh, well the first site we found them in green ash but then yes we found them in our orange ash yeah yeah and those were the trees that we found them in were in natural areas and in urban areas and Oregon ash yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, all right. Um, there's some chemical ecology that's very complex with the trees and the insects. So there's a question about, is there a pheromone that we can spray on the tree and that might work? Um, currently, no, we don't have anything identified. Um, we do from time to time isolate pheromones from insects. So for example, quick example, Doug fir beetle, native beetle in our landscape. Um, they put out an attractive pheromone that says, I want mates and I want folks to come on and infest this tree so we can break down the defenses in a power by power and numbers sort of fashion. So I'm gonna send out this attractive pheromone. It's a pheromone because it only speaks within that species. Then they go, okay, we've got enough of you. Um, they send out repellent pheromone. And so that tells them no more, um, no vacancy because they have no more real estate. They don't wanna eat themselves out of house and home. And so that's a really effective product that we actually use on trees. We staple these little pouches that are repellent pheromones and they tell a beetle, no, don't get into it. We haven't found that for emerald ash borer. That's, um, it's not common to find that for woodworm beetles because they do not work that way. They do not congregate together and take down a tree's defenses. They're not typically tree killers unless they're introduced to a non-native system. So we haven't identified that yet. However, and looking at the chemical defenses of the tree. So we do know in Manchurian ash, there are chemical defenses that can work against emerald ash borer. And sometimes you can get them to induce. So they come out at higher levels. Huh? If you spray with like a growth hormone or something that can uh, tell the tree to <laughs> Why? Up those um, repellent, um, not pheromones, uh, re re repellency chemical defense compounds. Um, so some research has been done on that. However, um, it's a little bit mixed on how well that works, that you may spray some trees and then the beetles don't really want those trees and other trees, they kind of do want those trees. So um, it's been a little mixed, ongoing research. A lot of people are looking into those things, but if, if they'd come up with something, we would have an answer and we don't. So it takes many years Just to, to get results from those kind of studies. Just the dishwasher. Okay, any more questions? Yes. All right. But I do want you to okay. do. Okay. Do you know what kind of woodpecker it was? Okay. So we have a woodpecker sighting in Oregon where they were doing some flecking on an infested emerald ash borer tree. I assume they would figure it out and we would see that same symptom, but you never know because we do see woodpecker flecking hitting after beetles in pine and Douglas fir for two specific beetles that work their way into the bark. We don't really see it as often in hardwoods. So I kind of wondered, like, would our woodpeckers figure this out? And of course they would. They're birds. They're smart. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So for folks on Zoom, um, lifespan of ash, 100 to 150 is typical, 200, not impossible, but crazy. Okay. All right.
But my assumption is that since it is called Ashen Creek, that there's a lot of ash. If it comes through and devastates a huge swath of even yeah. Do we know what would happen? Would we take those all out when they die? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. So large urban areas such as Ash Creek here locally, um, which likely have a large component of ash, what are we going to do? Um, preventative management, planting out some trees right now, not a bad idea, um, as long as you're not totally um, overpopulating the area because there's only so much water that can support those trees. Um, but it is at this point going to be on the landowner. We do not have funds and we can readily give people to assist with that yet. So I would say, hang tight, give it at least a year. We know that the uh, known infestations of emerald ash borer are at least 20 miles away. That might buy you a couple of years. It takes at least a couple of years for trees to get that are getting infested to die. You might have four years. So give it time, the funds will be there to assist. It's not likely that the government agencies will take care of all the costs. So maybe think in the back of your mind, you might need to save a few bucks for outplanting or removal of trees. Okay, parks, that's on us. <laughs> government will have to take care of that. But do expect that you're going to see, if I can leave you with one silver lining, First, it's going to be bad, though. Expect to see a whole bunch of dead trees, and it's going to be really sad. Um, but if we can change our thinking, and this is in climate change terms as well, that we need to be thinking of, we want to keep trees in our landscape, but they may not be the same species of trees that we've been used to seeing. We're used to seeing dead fir everywhere. Dead fir is not entirely drought tolerant. It's a middling drought tolerance. So we're already losing our Western red cedar. So we're gonna start seeing dead fir or valley pine or Oregon white oak in those areas. And at least we still have tree cover, right? And so in other areas, it's even drier. So maybe we're gonna be transitioning into incense cedar, maybe even sequoias. So if you can just shift what you expect to see where, and yes, this lends itself to assisted migration, but that's the direction we're heading. So desperate times call for desperate measures. If we want to see greener in the landscape, we need to shift our thinking in terms of what we expect to see where and at what density. So with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up. And thank you guys so much. I really appreciate um, your ears. I'm just going to say a brief closing sentence. Thank you all so much for being here in person and on Zoom. Um, once again, we're the Tryon Creek Watershed Council. You should all have gotten a little paper survey to fill out and a pen. Let us know if not. Let us know if you want to be on our email list. And if you want to help us make up that pizza cost, tryoncreek.org slash donate. That's all. Thank you.